everyone, and welcome again to another edition of the Open Science in Conversation webinar series. My name is Dylan Roskams Idris. I'm the Open Science Alliance Officer for the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute at the Neuro, and your host and moderator today. My colleague Anita Carr will be moderating the chat and collecting questions there. So feel free to engage with one another, as well as post questions that we'll return to after the conversation in the Q&A period at the end. If you've been involved in the open science world, or even in research generally, you'll almost certainly have heard about the open access movement. The movement that aims to facilitate the free access to all of the scientific literature. If you dig a little deeper, though, you'll realize that this movement is not monolithic. In fact, it's composed of an emerging ecology of strategies and stakeholders. You may well have heard the terms green open access, gold open access, diamond open access, bronze and hybrid open access, and transformative agreements. Unfortunately, in one webinar, we can't cover all of the details of all of these different concepts. But some of the most interesting approaches are the ones that build off the practice of sharing preprints. How exactly are guests from Peer Community In, or PCI for short, and eLife are doing so is going to be most of what we address today. PCI is a grassroots community of researchers using preprints to transform peer review. And in 2020, eLife announced that they would adopt a publish then review model, only reviewing pre papers that had already been shared as preprints and facilitating open peer review of those preprints. Okay, now that I've set the stage for you a little bit, I'd like to welcome Marjolaine Hamlin. She's the support officer at Peer Community Inn, directorate for Open Science, the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment, and Tim Behrens, Deputy Editor at eLife, Professor of Computational Neuroscience, and Deputy Director of the Wellcome Center for Integrative Neuroscience at the University of Oxford. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay, before we get into the meat of what eLife and PCI are doing, I think it'd be useful to start with giving a relatively short explanation of what preprints are, how they came about, and why they're increasingly important. So maybe if I can turn to you, Tim, first. Can you give us a little explanation of preprints and a little bit about their history in a moderately sized nutshell? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure quite who the audience is. So maybe I'll just start by saying traditionally uh, for, hundred, for, I don't know, a couple of hundred years, We've shared science uh, by sending it to journals uh, where other scientists have tried to evaluate it uh, and decide uh, whether that journal should publish it. And those, that's, that was, that's the peer review uh, model. Um, and uh, those uh, scientists have, uh, those um, articles have not been published until they've, they've been passed through peer review. Uh, that obviously introduces a lot of delay in the publishing, but but gets but establishes some uh, some rigor and uh, trust in the in what's published in those journals, and those journals are are, are therefore they they hold the trust of the scientific world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, preprints are a, a new way of uh, thinking where the authors can publish uh, papers online before they've been peer reviewed, so they can share 
uh, their work early, much more rapidly, um, and uh, and are therefore not uh, don't come with that same stamp of authority. Uh, but the but the um, the reader gets to evaluate them uh, by themselves. They are um, uh, they are they have been around in the physical sciences for quite a long time, mm -hmm. twenty or thirty years, um, with a thing called archive. Um, uh, and recently, they've become extremely popular uh, in the biological science, sciences um, as well. And so many biologists um, uh, and uh, increasingly medics uh, will. Will, will choose to publish their work as a preprint before sending it to a journal to share it faster. That's perfect. So you just brought up increased popularity in the, you said it's been around for a long time, but there's an increased popularity in the biomedical sciences and in a lot of different fields. Marjolaine, why this increased popularity? So as Tim said, uh, because uh, preprints are immediately available and compared to publication in journal where you can wait sometimes months and years before your article can be uh, read by, uh, by readers, preprints mm -hmm. are immediately available. Then they are free for readers and for authors on the contrary to gold open access articles or articles behind paywalls. And also because they are easily searchable and findable because they have a good visibility in database and in search engines. And um, so Tim mentioned BioArchive, which is a, which is a well-known um, preprint server in the biosciences. And it offers a lot of services to authors. And mm -hmm. there are also organizations such as uh, ASAP Bio, uh, who really help to promote uh, the use of preprints. They, ha they have a very useful directory of all the preprint servers. And so this also helps to increase the popularity of, of preprints. That it really sounds like it's science adapting to the possibilities that we now well, can achieve based on the internet and computers and being able to rapidly share knowledge with one another. Okay, so now that we understand preprints a little bit, um, let's dig into how Peer Community In and eLife are using them to change the way we share knowledge and change the way they do business. So first, Tim, can you tell us about the publish then review model? I remember being very excited when I read about it. So what does it have to do with preprints and what was eLife's motivation for moving to this model? Uh, well, eLife has always uh, been motivated by changing how publishing works. eLife wants to um, uh, make sure that publishing works better for the scientists um, mm -hmm. and, and is fairer and more open. Um, at the moment, publishing is um, uh, is is um, controlled by several large companies that make large profits out of publishing. Yes, and, uh, eLife um, made huge profits out of publishing. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, eLife wants to see if there are other ways of doing it. And so th this, we have a long history of trying things. Um, th this, this one is a, um, a big thing that we think can happen, effectively uh, trying to um, uh, divorce uh, the publication from the evaluation of science. Uh, so uh, we think there's no reason in the internet age, in the preprint age, uh, that those things uh, should, should go together. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, uh, so we wanted to like effectively totally change the way we operate in the, um, to uh, change from towards being a curator of science and to work out how you could live in this new world where people publish their preprints. I mean, I mean, we're not really publishers anymore. People have already published uh, our, our uh, uh, their work. We have to. Um, make sure we can draw attention. Our job, the community's job, and eLife as part of the community, is to make sure we can draw attention to the most interesting um, uh, um, preprints uh, or published pieces of work and make sure that we can um, give them the trust that a, a journal would normally uh, have given them. And so we've, we've been trying to think of ways to do that. And uh, effectively, we're trying to figure out, as a journal, how you can uh, what's needed uh, to get mm -hmm. that kind of uh, to get that kind of trust in preprints, and so we're working out uh, what a good public review would look like, whether we can um, uh, whether we can uh, uh, 
concisely summarize our opinions about papers and um, so that um, uh, so that we can uh, so that we can easily highlight the interesting papers in the same way that um, that a journal name would. Uh, but it gives a much yeah. more. But 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 the advantage of this is that the evaluation doesn't just happen at the point of acceptance. Uh, the evaluation can obviously continue, and the evaluation um, uh, is rich. It's not just summarized by the name of the journal like if, if there are excellent things about a paper but that some of the data is a bit weird then that can be said or if the and and um the whole thing is not about gatekeeping who can be published and who can't mm -hmm. be published it's about honestly evaluating what the authors think i mean that's that's what we're trying to achieve so publishing there understood as simply making it available to the world. It used to be done through putting it on a piece of paper and putting that piece of paper in a journal and then sending that journal out. That's how it was made available to the world. But in the internet age, as you just said, that can be done really easily, quickly and cheaply. And you're saying that your job then is to take that huge sea of information and curate it for your audience. So. Can you talk a little bit about what, what does that curation look like? What does peer review look like at eLife? How do you find preprints? Well, so firstly, I should say, um, we, this, that, what I just described is a, is a long-term ambition. And what we're doing now is trying to figure out how to do, do that. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we are, um, we're constrained by the, by the current system. So, so authors now, sending us papers uh still need the e-life name to get themselves jobs and um of and so we're now in this we're now in this in this two-stage system uh where we will try to openly review everything that gets sent to us um and um uh we're internally restructuring the journal to uh to try to make sure that our editorial board know how to write good learn how to write good public reviews um, but at the same time, we're still making these these binary gatekeeping de decisions about what will be published and what won't be published. I think that I think that the, anybody trying to do this is going to find themselves in this bind where I mean, you'll speak to Marjolaine later. But but um, uh, but the bind is that the, a researcher's whole life is embedded in these papers, and they need something mm -hmm. back. Um, and the, the, the currency that you can currently spend on your career is a journal name. And unfortunately, you, you, there needs to be a way that we can sort of escape from this local, from this, from this, this local valley to a new mountain of a different way of doing it. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to navigate and figure out uh, at eLife. And I think Marjolaine will, will say something similar as well. That's something I hear from most of the people I talk to about open science. There's a whole bunch of idealism about how we can change the way that research is conducted and that scientific knowledge is shared, but we still are embedded in a particular culture and system. And so finding the way to move from the existing system to that ideal is it's tough work. So thank you for kind of pioneering it for the rest of us. Okay. So if we're going to turn to Marjolaine, then we'll return to what Tim said in a little bit, but he will, one of the things that, you know, is arising for me out of this conversation is we've got preprints, we've got review and we've got journals. Previously, those were coupled together into a single unit or, you know, submitting, reviewing and publishing were coupled into a single unit. But as far as I understand, PCI is trying to decouple those concepts a little bit in order to make sure that scientific knowledge, even if it's not published in a final journal, still has the eyes and the minds of the scientific community on it to make sure that there's quality control. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're doing that decoupling and you know what the piece de resistance of uh, PCI is? So uh, Tim mentioned the, the divorce between uh, publication and evaluation, and this is really a goal that we share with eLife. So to evaluate and validate preprint, highlighting them, to, to clearly distinguish them from the, all the others who are not, which are not validated by the community. And uh, so this really makes sense because of the huge amount of preprints that 
that are available on, on preprint servers and get, that mm -hmm. can serve the, the open access uh, need. And uh, so to reach this goal, PCI relies on, uh, on communities of associate editors like uh, researchers who are called recommenders and who organize the peer review of, of preprints. So they invite reviewers and they make decisions on the basis of the review reports and they decide or not to, um, to recommend the preprints. So the, indeed, this evaluation system is uh, very similar to, the, to, to what happens in journals, but there are differences. Uh, the, the main difference, difference is that the peer review is uh, transparent, which is the case in some journals with open peer review system, but there are very few journals like this for the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, like eLife, we don't have professional editors. We have uh, active uh, researchers who are involved in PCIs as recommenders, as managers, as reviewers. And, um, and also the, 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 the big difference between PCI and, and the journal is that PCI's, PCI only publishes recommendations, which are uh, editorial decisions with the reviews. And uh, the publisher, as Tim said before, is the preprint server uh, by mm -hmm. archive, for example. So, uh, and, and the fact to, to, to publish all this editorial work with the reviews makes it visible and also citable because there is a DOI associated with the recommendation. So mm -hmm. this helps to valorize this, uh, all the work which is done by, by the recommenders and the reviewers. So, Yes, the, uh, we, we really try to decouple the, the, the publication on the preprint server and the evaluation, which is the work done on the PCI website. Mm -hmm. And there is no real need to publish in a journal afterwards, uh, after this process, because the article is already uh, available on the preprint server. That makes a heck of a lot of sense. One of the things that strikes me most about it, and I just want to hone down on this, and Tim can respond if he likes, you're saying that you know it's not professional editors that are doing this. It's the scientific community itself that's facilitating the recommendation and the review of these preprints. And like that, that's something that's pretty inspiring to me. I think that's the way, or something similar is at work at eLife. Isn't that right, Tim? Yeah. So. Uh, we definitely are a community-driven journal, and we definitely don't have any, any non-scientists making any decisions or mm. writing any reviews. The, um, uh, the, the other thing that eLife does is try to make um, uh, infrastructure so that other people can get involved. Um, mm. And so uh, we're trying to make, we try to make infrastructure so that other journals can take on the the the, the type of um, uh, approaches that we're doing to make it easy for them, but also we're trying to make infrastructure to uh, to present um, uh, public reviews and make them easy to digest and make and and curate uh, the public. If like let's say several like one journal club has written a public review just independently, and then and some and then eLife has written some public reviews, and then maybe PCI have written some public reviews all in the same paper, which is totally plausible. Then we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to make ways of trying to um, to make it a really community thing, and so we have this website, Society, which uh, which is independent of eLife, which is trying to curate all the public reviews that are written about different um, d different um, uh, papers into the same place, uh, so that um, uh, so that you can get a, an overall feel of it. I think that there's the, the biggest issue is, is not going to how we um, how we write these uh, how we get these reviews or who writes these reviews I'm, i think we'll be able to find people to write these reviews the biggest issue is how we summarize them into a way that's useful to the authors uh that, that's the real that, that's the real thing i mean currently your nature paper however many times you've however many years you've 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 spent with it or however many um thousands of dollars you've paid nature to publish it they um uh they it's still worth more than that it's worth a whole career to some people right. uh, like and they they so we have to find ways of of um of concisely making value for the authors and so 
uh, yeah, that, that that's a, a, the biggest open question as far as I can see, and it, it's going to mean need uh, active negotiation with the community, with the uh, with the uh, funding agencies, and with hiring panels to make sure that that we can find a way that's useful to those people, uh, such that we we can write something that's as useful as, as a nature like label. Uh, when when if we can do that, then then. Uh, there's no reason for the journals to. I mean, that, what they the reason they exist now mainly is those labels, right? Right. It. It. I mean, it sounds like the classic double-edged sword of the modern information age. We get so much more information, so many more people can contribute, and yet when that many people contribute, how how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? How do you make sure that it's useful to the people who are actually receiving it? Which I mean, maybe this is the perfect time for me to turn to Marjolaine and say, okay, I'm a Researcher, I have a preprint. I wanted to go through the PCI process. What does that look like? So the first step for you, for you would be to uh, deposit your data, script, and code on a repository because this is mandatory for um, to for f for the submission to a PCI. Good on you. Uh, uh, then it would be you would have to upload your manuscript on a on a preprint server, whatever you, the, which one you, you prefer, and to submit the link of this preprint to the, the PCI you are targeting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once the, the, the manuscript is validated by the PCI team after a, a technical check, then the preprint will be available for the, the suggested recommenders. The, the, the recommenders who have been suggested by the authors to evaluate their preprints. Mm -hmm. if, so if one of these uh, recommenders decides to handle the, the preprint, then he, he starts to organize the, the peer review process, he invites reviewers, get the reports, submit his decision. And then on the basis of the decision, the, um, the author can revise their preprint upload right. a new version on the preprint server and this process can continue until the final version is um, accepted by the recommender as a final version as a mm -hmm. version that can be recommended and then the recommender will write a short text which is the, the recommendation which has the title uh, which has references which is like a short news and views and this is the, the, the recommendation that will be published on the, on the PCI website. There's something interesting about, so the, 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 that, that process is, um, uh, has a binary outcome in the way that a journal publication does, which means somehow that you think in the long term that it's that, that's attributing value to your name rather than to the review is, is like, but basically, you're going to decide to publish the good papers or to recommend the good papers, right? And they, so, um, it, the, there is something, there is some spiritual difference between the way we some, see it. I think. I think that we would like mm. our name to indicate that the reviews are trustworthy, but not to indicate that the paper is trustworthy. We would like the people, people to read the reviews to know whether the paper, whether the paper is trustworthy. I think that's the. And so, yeah, maybe we're facing different issues for that reason. I mean, your your issue is the same issue that a journal has. How do I increase the profile of my name? Whereas we would somehow like our name to be irrelevant and uh, except to, to make them trust the reviewers. Oh, what do you think about that, Marjolaine? Is that an accurate characterization? Well, the point is we cannot uh, we cannot evaluate all the papers and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the idea is really to highlight the, 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 the studies which are really, uh, which are, which have a, a nice design, which are, which have, which have a solid methods. And this is the idea behind peer community. So we decided not to publish uh, the, the review process of the, um, of the articles which are not recommended. But the reviews still, um, we, 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 the, the authors get the reviews at the end so they can still improve their papers and do whatever they want after submitting to a journal or whatever. But yeah, the, the choice was made, made to only highlight the, 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 um, the articles which, are, which, which have value, value for the recommenders 
Mm -hmm. But I would say it's more the name of, of it's more the, an endorsement by, by a recommender of a paper rather than uh, the PCI endorsement. Well, it's because it's, a, it's an article, again, the, the edi editorial decision is published by a recommender and he publishes his name, so he endorses really the responsibility for, the, for his decision. So, yeah. So, so re returning to one thing that you said earlier that I just want to unpack a little bit, you said you're not publishing papers, you're publishing reviews and the review process itself. Can you just comment quickly on why is that so important? Why is it so important to make sure that, you know, if it's recommended and it's all published, the PCI facilitates the visibility uh, and findability of the work that the reviewers and recommenders put into refining this paper? So uh, uh, researchers put a huge work uh, in evaluating papers. We, uh, mm -hmm. uh, peer review uh, could not exist without reviewers and this work is voluntary work. It's never, it's really invisible and it's uh, nearly never uh, acknowledged by the, in the evaluation uh, system. Uh, it's more to publish a journal, which is to publish an article, which is acknowledged, but evaluating article it's, is, has no, not so much value. And uh, so the, the publication of the, the decision and the reviews makes this work uh, visible and um, yeah that's that's a way to acknowledge all this work uh, done by the reviewers because uh, when you when you talk with researchers uh, every day in a lab they said oh okay today i receive uh, 10 invitations uh, to review papers so i'm fed up i will decline everything and i will never <laughs> i will no longer review yeah. papers because i have no time to do that but if all the researchers decide to do that, then there is no longer peer reviews and you cannot publish articles. So then the system we breaks down. Find, we have to find the kind of way to uh, incentives for for quality reviews. As Tim said, it's important to have quality reviews, not just like or um, in like uh, in, in social networks, uh, mm -hmm. very short. Um, comments we, we really need high quality reviews and we have to find ways to acknowledge this work so could someone just digging into the process could someone go through the pci process get recommended it goes public and then submit that to a journal like elife for example yes yes uh, indeed uh, Authors, if they need to publish in a journal afterwards, they, they would have the choice to um, uh, to submit to a, a peer community journal, which is a journal which will be launched in a few weeks that we decided to launch because, I mean, to answer to this need, to this context of the evaluation based on journal articles, uh, authors could also have the choice to submit to a um, um, PCI-friendly journal, uh, eLife is a PCI-friendly journal, or they could also try to submit to other journals and who, uh, who could decide or not to use the, the PCI reviews. But so, authors keep the, the hand on the, on the articles, they, they decide of what they want to do after the, the recommendation. So Tim, your eLife works with a number of these different kind of community-based review of preprint type uh, organizations. What does it look like when one of those review pre already reviewed preprints gets submitted to Eli? Uh, we get the reviews and um, uh, we um, take a look through those reviews uh, as well as taking our uh, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we um, will do one of several things. Well, so it can save time because when we can, we can. Um, just invite the reviewers to come and discuss with us there where the papers we published maybe they just say yes in which case we, mm -hmm. uh, we, we we could do that or we might think well those reviewers are um are not the people that we would have chosen for various reasons so might, we might go and get another reviewer um or um often our editors will say um those reviews from those those 
we're also so our editors also has also scientists and also can evaluate the paper and so they'll say those reviews i don't agree with those reviews or they'll say um and maybe they'll triage the paper but i mean right if if they it, i would say that i would say that um the papers with PCI or um, uh, Review Commons, or there, there are several of these things, um, with the reviews coming into eLife, they they don't have a much better chance of getting through triage of, mm. uh, than other papers, but they w are much less likely to spend a long time in review than other papers. I mean, most of the reviewing mm -hmm. is done. Yeah. So if they get through triage, they've got a much, yeah, exactly. Okay. There's a, the, the a lot we could go into there, but I want to return to this idea of trust because trust and science is a big area of conversation right now, no matter what you're talking about, whether it's climate change or vaccines or whatnot. So trust is an issue that both eLife and PCI and everybody in the scientific and publishing world are dealing with right now. It's all well and good to say you want to transform publishing, but ultimately you have to do so in a way that makes this sure that the science itself is trustworthy and make sure that people trust the process by which things are, by which science and knowledge are reviewed. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about how do these concepts of trust influence your organizations? Maybe I could turn to Tim first. Well, Eli starts from a good place there. Eli is a very trusted journal for the, mm -hmm. uh, serious scientists which has a rigorous uh, peer review system already and eLife is transparent uh, has always right. been transparent about how the way it's reviewed papers and so if you if a paper has been poorly reviewed and it's published in eLife you can see that for yourself um so i, I think that does add trust that's the historic eLife and i think the new eLife will profit from that so and mm -hmm. we are um we are still public so, so we're, we're publishing those reviews and the sort of summary statement that tells you what we on overall what we think and so mm -hmm. the trust the trust issue is really if somebody's going to read all the way through the reviews that we're publishing then they don't have to trust us they can like evaluate us uh yes but the, so the, the trust issue is whether or not we can write a concise this is good this is bad statement at the top which you will believe mm -hmm. really reflects uh the reviews um that that, that are underneath and it's a hard thing to do because if things are, if there are negative detailed complications in the reviews, summarizing that effectively also in a way that doesn't damage the authors is, yeah. um, it, it is difficult. And so that, as I say that, I think that's really the, the, the most, the most, the, the most uncertainty for me is whether that's possible in a way that's useful for people, was really useful for people and isn't, uh, and authors are not allergic to because, uh, yeah, so I think that's a complication. But I think mm -hmm. that, and I think there's another, there's another interesting thing that maybe your viewers haven't thought about, which is that um, the other tr bit of trust is that Eli should be able to pick qualified reviewers, articulate right. uh, um, who, who might find flaws, and you might think that if all the reviews are open, that isn't an issue. You can just see who the reviewers are yourself by looking at the names. Um, but I think that isn't uh, a good way to go for the open access hmm. movement. I, I think it will exclude a lot of the community. Hmm. Um, there are many members of our community that wouldn't write um, that wouldn't write uh, openly sign a review. There are many who would write who would write a different review if it was signed, and there were many and there are many that would write. Um, uh, that, that would write a, a, an open review of some scientists, but not of other scientists, because they don't trust right. those scientists to be professional. And so uh, it will introduce all sorts of complicated biases if we move to a system where we have to, um, where everybody has to sign their reviews. And in the absence of that, you need something like PCI or eLife as a trusted body, as in somewhere something between the reviewers and uh, names and the uh, and the review that gets published, and so mm -hmm. I, I, that's another big issue of trust that, that that will be important is which of these bodies can reliably uh, get high quality reviews. And I think that's another thing to say about some of the um, th there are some bodies now, like for example, Review Commons. 
Ruby Commons is uh, very well established in cellular biology and, and has no trouble getting reviewers, but in neuroscience, it, there aren't very many journals that are involved, very few neuroscientists send stuff to Review Commons. And so when we get neuroscience things from Review Commons at eLife, often it really isn't from the reviewers that we would have picked. It's from people who are less qualified uh, than we would have picked because, because the top reviewers are, are don't review don't know what Review Commons is, effectively. Hmm. Yeah, exactly in neuroscience, whereas they do in cell biology, et cetera, et cetera. So, Be so there's, there's, yeah, there's complications there, yeah. I mean, these, this, this intersection of science, which is supposed to be human beings grasping towards whatever version of objectivity we can possibly get to, and the political reality of being a human being embedded in a culture is something that I find endlessly fascinating, admittedly frustrating sometimes, but I, I, I think that, you know, everybody's in this position where they're trying to figure out how do we get the best possible knowledge knowledge that people will trust while at the same time being embedded in an existing set of incentives and stakeholders and political considerations. Um, yeah, so that we don't, yeah. you know, go off entirely. Sorry, you can respond, please. I mean, it's pragmatism and, and you can see it right here, right? So, I mean, eLife and PCI have exactly the same ambitions. We'd like to support each other, but eLife will not commit to, to publishing based solely on the PCI reviewers because we also know we need to have trust. People, our readers need to trust us. And so you end up with a uh, with a complicated dynamic where people trying to do the same thing are sometimes in conflict with each other. Um, and um, and I think that that is just the pragmatics of how it's going to work. And we should just support each other whenever we can. But if we just can't, then we don't then we have to plow our own for, for it. Yeah, exactly. I'm a big fan of pragmatism. OK, trust, PCI, Marjolaine, what are your thoughts? I I fully agree with what Tim just said about uh, about the transparency being the key a key factor for trust and also about the the control of of the of the peer review process. I mean the mod moderation of the of the peer review process by by scientists uh, who supervise the the, the whole uh, evaluation. Uh, but um, I would add the. Uh, the fact that um, we should promote also uh, science um, reproducibility and mm -hmm. by promoting all the, the fair principle for data, open data and open code and all all these all these um, all, all these parameters of open science that work for science well make make science more trustable and and um, so. There is another aspect also which could be interested, interesting is the, the publication of the registered report, the pre-registration, mm -hmm. so, uh, which uh, force uh, with kind, kind of um, um, force the whole, to have the whole process of the, of the, um, uh, of research uh, very, uh, I mean, yeah, transparently out at, there. Yeah, transparently and, and state the hypothesis at the beginning and and validate this before the result to prevent all the the bias of uh, of the negative results and and yeah. So, so this for, for, all, all this uh, process can can help to to build trust uh, in in yeah in science and also to on the on the. On the point of uh, how how PCI can can get trust on, on his process, we also have the support of uh, all the support we can have from uh, universities, research organizations, and and doctoral schools. Also helps to create trust in in, in our system as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question that I'm interested in as all of these new organizations and online tools for facilitating interaction with knowledge come about is when we look at social media platforms, for example, like Facebook, like Twitter, like whatnot, where we have all these very superficial interactions between individuals and about knowledge, there's some dangers to that, obviously. Um, when it comes to the spread of misinformation, when it comes to the ability to meaningfully comment on you know, a piece of paper or a preprint or something that gets published. 
Do you see this as a worry either for your communities or more generally that the mistakes that are being made in the kind of social media world where you know a couple of people have this outsized influence or spread misinformation um, is that a worry within your communities or more generally within the kind of open access movement as it adapts to the possibilities of online interactions? Either one, whoever wants to go first. So I, I, I think that that's what we're trying to stop. I think yeah. that there's a real, I think there's a problem there, but I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I haven't convinced myself whether it's a bigger problem than the than the outside influence that scientists have at journals. I mean, there's, 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 there are huge biases in the existing system. There are huge yeah. biases on, on on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the the huge. It's not 100% clear to me whether those biases end up being worse. So Twitter has things that you wouldn't like. It has very influential people that can spread some people's work much more uh, than other people uh, than other people's. Um, and those people aren't always the experts in that field. In many cases, they're not. <laughs> Don't they're I know it? Yeah. The, the, however, it also has a really effective, uh, there are also really rapid, informed, excellent conversations, really good, great threads from the authors explaining what's going on. Like there is, there are, um, there's really, the science Twitter has really good stuff on it. That yeah. Is, um, uh, it's unfortunately not really recorded. You have it's impossible to go and find those things when, when you they're not tied to the papers in any way. But um, but so I think that that, that there, there are good things and bad things about science Twitter, and um, uh, I, I'm not 100 percent sure whether a system that was just based on science Twitter would end up better or worse than the journal system, which is also covered in uh, biases where people having outsized influence is. Indeed. But but. I, I guess the challenge is to make something that has the best of both worlds, that has the ability for people to um, uh, identify flaws and that to be and that to be flagged with the uh, alongside um, the papers or conversations uh, alongside going on alongside the papers, but at the same time having serious uh, um, reviews um, that are um, that are that are that are articulating the kinds of decisions that you that used to be made in journals and hopefully giving more people the opportunity to contribute to, to evaluation those are the kinds of things that you'd like to be able to do I, I don't know whether the thing that ends up doing those things will look like what we're doing now but but nothing has ever been done without trying stuff so so yeah. we have to try stuff thank goodness you're experimenting with it so that the rest of us can learn I as, as a little aside I think I've called I think I've heard those threads on Twitter called a, a tweet print yeah right exactly right. I, I, think, I think that's pretty catchy um okay we're getting close to the end here but marjolaine is there anything you wanted to say on this like avoiding the dangers of social media topic? that might be yeah, that that might be one also one aspect is the the very time the time consuming parameter of having uh, comments and, and articles and information uh, on many platforms and in many forms. And this is where what, what uh, eLife does with the society project, for example, is really, uh, is really useful, is gathering everything to make it uh, useful and, and for, for users, for our researchers to find information at the same place uh, very easily because uh, uh, people cannot read everything and cannot respond to a, any comment and, and cannot yeah. review everything. And this is really <laughs> an issue for... It's incredibly yeah. hard. I hear yeah. this all the time where I, I talk to some people who have been in, a, in neuroscience for 50 years and they say when they started their career, they could actually keep up with the literature. Now, keeping up with the literature is near impossible. Before we move to the question and answer period, my last comment at least is that what you keep bringing up when we talk about trust is this idea of transparency. And for me, that is a real key to be able to at least see the processes through which knowledge was evaluated and generated. Um, I think that that's absolutely fundamental and that what, something that both of your organizations hold at the kind of center of their mandate and efforts. And I super appreciate that. Okay. We're at 11.45. 
Uh, it's time for our question and answer period. Thank you very much for that conversation. I could talk to both of you all day, but unfortunately we are all, you know, time is a scarce resource. There's obviously a lot to learn and a lot to do and a lot to experiment with. And as we find our way to recreating the way that research and knowledge is shared. Let's move on to the question and answer period. If you've put a question in the chat and I can see that there's a quite a few questions in the chat, thank you very much. If you haven't put one in, you can pop it in now and we can hope to get to it. So let's look at a couple of questions. I'll read them out, put them to you, and then you can address them as you wish. So there's one from Anonymous. That person is extremely pro prolific when it comes to asking questions. So what can be done from the institutional and funding body levels to encourage a shift away from the traditional funding model or traditional publishing model? What do you think? So uh, let me just, uh, so I don't know, maybe Marlene, you want to start? I don't mind. No, I, I was I, I was going to say that the, the, the DORA uh, initiative was a start, a good start for, for that, but um, well, it's it's only a start, and and it's difficult to to move away from the journal um, entity, and and also from the uh, we need we need new uh, indicators. Uh, somehow we need to be, to build new um, new metrics uh, mm -hmm. to help to help um, to help also uh, funding and in, in institutions um, to to funding bodies and institutions to um, to find new ways to uh, to evaluate uh, research and and to move away yeah from this model that makes sense i i i i guess i also think that it's changing i sit on hiring panels and and and, and funding agency panels and um uh, and people put preprints on their CVs now, and those those are, are not ignored in the way they were. It used to mm. be just hilarious. It used to be just ignored. if you put submitted to journal or something next to your work when before it was published, it used to be just ignored by I mean, until it's in a journal and nobody cared about it. But now they right. go and read it. People do, and and some people put a lot of preprints, and maybe the, some people have got jobs. I know people who have got jobs based on preprints. What mm. we like, what we'd like is for them to get. Uh, jobs based on evaluations of preprints that, that for those to be considered right. uh, in in the, in the uh, peer review in the in the hiring agency process, and uh, indeed the Wellcome Trials HMI say that pu like publicly on their website we consider preprints to be papers, but they don't yet say we take evaluations of preprints seriously. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that. I think that they, they might do that quite soon. So HHMI and eLife are two of our big funders. HHMI are very, very proactive about this mission. Um, and so I think that, that, that there's a reasonable chance that we can lobby them uh, to, uh, to, to, to take uh, our to take PCIs or our preprints evaluations as seriously as a journal, um, as, a, yeah. as a journal. Uh, that, that, I think that will work. I think, I, I think that with the charities, it will work. I think the really the mm. real difficult thing is going to be the NIH, where the journals have a lot of lobbying power with government and and and, and congressmen get involved. Um, uh, that's pretty hard. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, some of the European governments have uh, have real issues about about um, uh, dictating uh, what can and can't uh, about public declarations of where public money can and can't go. And so I think that. That that will be hard to get to get um, public money to be spent on the basis of our evaluations. Well, uh, to some change in that, but hope. But I think that a lot of the most um, influential money comes from these massive charities, and so I'm hoping that that will be at least a, a, that we can manage to make that kind of start. Certainly, we've been trying to lobby for it. I that also wish, please. I, I also, I, I also wish that bioarchive would change so that so that when we evaluate when we when we when we um, when we currently what well, it's quite ironic on bioarchive we put our reviews up but bioarchive still have a statement saying this paper has not been peer reviewed please don't trust <laughs> right I, I think that, yeah that one change will make a difference if, if that changed to being a new type of bioarchive paper that yeah. would almost be as good as being published in a journal, right? And they have an opportunity to do this. We're trying to actually. I'm speaking to Richard Siva in ten minutes about this, but um, uh, but they have an opportunity 
to 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 just to change the flag on bioarchive which will immediately say that the authors can say that flag has changed in their yeah. in their uh in their cv that would be a and big I, thing and sorry <laughs> i i think that like we should also just uh, highlight that preprint servers are not static things they also change over time just the, earlier this yeah. year there was a little metrics bar that was added over top of preprints and yeah. bioarchive in response to some of the criticisms about spreading disinformation, they put that little bar that you're yeah. talking about right now. Like this is not a pre pre, pre uh, uh, not a peer reviewed journal, so don't trust it. It's a little less flip than that, but that's that's the uh, the, the the gist that, of it. There are there are actually bioarchive with the trip um, projects now um, displays uh, whether there have been comments or reviews and that so. Then things are also changing on the way uh, preprint servers uh, display the, the the existing reviews on a, on the so preprints. Just, just to yeah. plug eLife again, so that that's all that's all powered by Society, yeah. which is uh, which which is like this, the, yeah, yeah, built, built, mm -hmm. built in together with eLife basically. Well, uh, plug away. Okay, moving on to another question. So we're not just you know holding on to this one for the whole time. We've got some questions from Francis Ouellette. Hello, Francis. Um, he asked, will it be difficult to change the reviewing culture itself for it to be open? He says, as an editor, I find it sometimes difficult to find reviewers and finding open reviewers will be even harder. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, uh, if I can uh, start. Uh, Please. I, I think uh, uh, we have nearly 40% of our reviewers who, stay, who uh, prefer staying anonymous. So mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. I think uh, um, point of view, views are really uh, different on on the on the anonymity uh, level um, mm -hmm. aspect for for peer review. So uh, yeah, we have to let leave some time for culture to change. And it's but it's not it's it's also hard for peer community to find reviewers, but not because of the of the disclosed identity mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I think it's also difficult it's it's difficult in, in journals and it, it's it's it has mostly to do i think with the the amount of articles that are published and the amount of uh, invitations that the researcher receive that rather than the the fact that uh, reviews are published or not but this is my opinion <laughs> So, so I can give you some reflection on that as well. Um, at Eli, at Eli, uh, we are not going to publish their names, and so there's no, it's not, it's no harder for that reason to find uh, reviewers uh, for hmm. reasons that I was talking about uh, earlier. Um, the uh, it, it might, but you might argue that it's just harder to write a public review, more work, and hmm. I think probably it is. You have to be a bit more careful what you say. Um, but then you, and, but then you get to see the, pro the proceeds of that work, and everybody can read it, and th that's a, a benefit. And, and there are, so we have had some complaints from reviewers that it's just there's endless more work, more this, more that. And actually, we asked them to write different sections in our in our review. One mm. is a little public, one is a public section, and one is a section because we're still making decisions. One is a section that's not about the preprint; it's about the decision. And so it's a little bit mm. more work. That than writing a normal review would be, but not 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 a great deal. You still have to spend the same amount of time reading and understanding the paper. Anyhow, the so there are some people that have complained about that, but the vast majority of the effect of the effect of this on reviewers that we've had is enthusiasm from younger researchers who want mm. to read life, who want to be part of something transformative and 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 new. Um, and so uh, I would say that it's not been harder to find reviews under this new model than it was under the old model. Um, and the eLife review also involves this really cool conversation between reviewers, which our reviewers really, really like. And so in general, finding reviewers for eLife is easier than it has been at any other journal I've worked at, and it remains so with this new model. Huh. So I guess while we have to adapt to this existing culture, we can't forget the fact that the culture is defined by the people and the young researchers are the ones who are going to define the culture in the future. So maybe as they become more senior, it's going to become easier and easier. Okay, next question. Also from Francis, do you see a day 
where NCBI and PubMed and PMC, all these indexing services will index preprints from things like BioArchive and MedArchive. Maybe Tim first, if you have an opinion. Uh, I I maybe maybe I um, see a different day where PMC won't be quite as relevant as it is now. And ah. <laughs> um, probably, I fully agree. Uh, um, Google Google Scholar indexes them, yeah. and and um, I, I mean I don't know. I mean PMC. I I, I don't think that that's going to hold the, the the show up, right? I think mm -hmm. that um, if if we win this game, then PMC will have to index them, or it'll go or it'll go broke. Uh, right. So I don't think it's going to hold up the show up. That uh, I think the people submitting to us are not worried, so worried about. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, about being in this. Maybe that's actually different in medicine right now. Uh, but very few people are getting their. I mean, I think very few people are getting their their list of what to read from PMC at the moment. Outside medicine, in medicine, I think it's still it's still very powerful. Right, but Google Scholar is kind of the, the the place where a whole bunch of folks go now in order to be able to find knowledge, or even just Google itself. There's there's, um, all the okay. many, there's many ways to find knowledge now. Um, let's see. Question four. Also anonymous. This person is prolific. Um, how would the evaluation be standardized to meet open science goals? Thank you, anonymous. I, so I guess we're getting at the point of standardizing evaluation in such a way that they can be usefully compared with one another, perhaps? So uh, I, I think that there's, there's a, um, uh, there are big interesting questions there about what are the outputs of an evaluation. Hmm. And for PCI, the output is a recommendation on some reviews. And for eLife, the output is a summary and some reviews. And that mm -hmm. summary might, might in the future contain, so there are, the, there are these lovely things that the COVID review group have done. They are, they're another group that have got together to rapidly review COVID papers amazingly and have been very influential throughout the past two years. Uh, but they do lovely things like have little bars for strength of evidence or significance mm. of conclusions, that, that, like that kind of thing. Which is um, uh, which is um, uh, totally um, which it, which is obviously like um, a, a, a very concise summary of what you think. This is a three out of five for yeah. evidence. Not that good, but and some are more. Like, and I think those things, the, 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 those types of things, could plausibly be standardized. I think a little summary which says this is the most influential thing in my field for twenty years. Um, uh, is uh, uh, there's no way you could summarize that. You're trying to yeah. capture what the, what the people have achieved. Um, uh, the, this, I, I think it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to standardize these things across journals. And so right. uh, again, I mean, like if I, there's going to be incentives for different, different curators uh, to either be, I mean, like, I don't know if you guys have Strictly Come Dancing in Canada, but, but, but like, <laughs> one, similar one, shows, one, yes. One of the judges is always really harsh, um, yep. and he's, and he's sort of trusted more, and then the other one's always really generous, and so the, 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 the authors like him most. I mean, like, there's going to be incentives, <laughs> there's going to be incentives for people not to have those standardized, and that, that's an interesting game to be played, but at least within journals, we could maybe try and standardize those. That makes sense. Uh, Marjolaine, do you have a final comment before we move to the end? Yeah, I would, I would not see standardization of, of evaluation as a goal. I, I think it's really quality, um, quality of the of the reviews of the of the whole evaluation process, taking care of the, the conflict of interest uh, risks and, and mm -hmm. having all, all the process con really controlled and transparent. This is really the, the, the important point, uh, but having a standard of evaluation, I, I don't see really the, 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 this as a goal for open science. Yeah. Okay. I, I, mean, I, think, I think the thing that is being suggested is, look, if you guys don't care about the name of the journal, then, then you need some standard metric whereby different journals do things on the same thing so that you can evaluate the paper against things in different places or the, uh, different curators. That makes I, sense. That's really a very long way off. I, th I think I, I think we should just worry about being relevant as curators first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and then maybe we'll settle on something. Okay, we've reached the end of our hour. I want to thank everybody for joining us for this webinar. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. In upcoming Open Science and Conversation webinars, we're going to explore ideas around, well, the breadth of open science, the role of funding organizations, building common ground between neuroscience research institutes in Canada, and some of the open science initiatives constantly emerging. Also, quick note, the Neuro is holding its Open Science in Action Symposium, organized by the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute, November 23rd and 24th this year. Visit the Neuro website at mcgill.ca slash neuro to learn more and register. And finally, I'll leave you with this. At the Neuro, we believe that being transparent in research practices and embracing open collaboration will transform research and patient care to improve lives. We encourage all of you to be part of the open science revolution. If you're a researcher, consider submitting a preprint or becoming one of part of the, one of the emerging communities that are recommending and reviewing them. If you're a patient, ask how you can be involved with open research studies. And if you're a member of the public, talk about it. Science belongs to all of us and we need everyone working together to make the open science revolution happen. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to the guests. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.